as the billows of dark smoke filled the air on the 7th of August 1998, Kenyan security agencies awoke to one bitter truth that they were not prepared to quickly deal with what happened. Looking at the scene 10 years later, it seems as if no one could have been prepared for this. But still, Kenya security forces seemed overwhelmed and out of ideas at a time when Kenya's face was bloodied in a war that it had for most of its history never taken part in. But the planner of the 1998 bomb blast, Mohamed Fazul, always knew this. We are relatively weak in security, protecting ourselves from terrorists. Uh, Sometimes terrorists choose soft spots. Kenyan authorities have disputed this, but one fact remains true in this statement, at least as concerns the Kikambala and U.S. bombings. As far as protecting the integrity of our borders in such a hostile environment, Kenya still faces a serious challenge. Kenya uh, sits right next to Somalia and right next to Sudan. It has a huge open border and coastline. Al-Qaeda continues to operate in East Africa. And so uh, there is therefore uh, certainly there is still a terrorist threat today. This threat is expressed not least in the ease with which Mohamed Fazul and several other suspected Al-Qaeda operatives entered the country at different times prior to 2002. Our journey between Mombasa and Kiunga revealed that, at least at different points in the journey, an attempt at deterrence by the police has been made. But between Mokowe, the last town to Lamu, and Kiunga, 150 kilometers away, is an inhospitable stretch. A stretch that, judging from the local administration's insistence that we take an escort of three armed administration police along with us, is also fraught with a looming possibility of shifter raids from the other side of the Kenya-Somalia border. The administration police we had along with us not once during the five-hour drive took their eyes off the road and environment around us ready at any moment for an ambush. Kiunga, a small, nondescript town, only came into focus of the government after the 2002 bombings. After tracing Fazul's route into the country to Siu, and after the intermittent violence in Somalia after the transitional federal government took on the Islamic Courts Union, both a military post and a police post were set up kilometers away from each other. That would stop anyone determined to come in, but only if they were traveling by land. Kiunga is just 13 kilometers from Raskamboni in Somalia and a further 30 kilometers from Kismayo. Kismayo, where the Islamic Courts Union, perceived by the United States as sympathetic to the Al-Qaeda, made its last stand against the transitional federal government before being overrun. They ran towards Kiunga. Among the refugees hid terrorists, a number who attempted to slip through our borders. The hope would be that the sea is too harsh a means for terrorists to get into Kenya but for a number of terrorists, it wasn't. In 2002, right after the Kikambala bombing, terrorists attempted to bring down a plane with Israeli passengers but failed. The attacks happened within minutes of each other and had been planned for close to a year, and the sea was an integral part of their plans. It was in early 2002 that intelligence reports indicate that terrorists brought a missile launcher into Kenya through the Old Town port of Mombasa to launch an attack on soft Israeli tourist targets later on in the year. Now five years on and the ports are said to be more secure, but questions still abound as to how secure our seaports are in the global fight against terrorism. Every ship at the Old Town port is now checked by the immigration officers, but its cargo, as we observed, could escape the notice of officers not keen on combing through the cargo. This shark meat, for instance, has come from Kismayo in Somalia. Observing the crew of this ship shuttling back and forth carrying this meat to the port, we saw no officer check the meat. There may have well been no reason for scrutinizing the cargo so closely, but could this be so easy a means through which terrorists can transport their own cargo? Aside from the challenges in policing our borders that still remain, a concerted effort has been made on the part of the authorities to catch Fazul. The intelligence networks on the man seem to be intact, tracking his movements within Kenya so accurately that in 2002, these reports led to his capture for using fake credit cards. But somehow, in a disconnect between intelligence and enforcement, he slipped out of custody. The 2007 bombings of Somalia in a US airstrike were less accurate than Kenya's intelligence agencies in tracking his whereabouts. 
For a while, the U.S. State Department alleged that Fazul had been killed in a January 7, 2007 airstrike on Ras Kamboni. They were wrong. Fast forward to today and Fazul's faith passports are in the hands of Kenya's anti-terrorism squad. Just this past weekend, he managed to slip the noose once again. Again, someone in the enforcement wing of Kenya's security agencies is said to have tipped him off. So why can't Fazul be caught? These answers, quite predictably, lie in our answers to questions about the war on terror. Are they subjective? Fanatics um, uh, know no bounds, whether religious or in any other way, but the people who carry out these attacks obviously aren't true Muslims and they're not true Christians. Subjectivity and perception are the biggest impediments to the war against terrorists subjectivity has shackled both the Muslim community and Americans as well as Israelis and many sympathizers of the coalition against terror. By looking at America as the cause of all their problems, the Muslim community has condemned a community that is many times a victim of terrorism. Forgetting that by largely staying silent when America was attacked, they lose friends who will cry for them when their house is on fire. The West, too, has antagonized the world of moderates in the fight against terror by their insistence on laws that could potentially harm sections of the community and by, through their alleged part in the arbitrary arrest of Muslims worldwide, and by not understanding why nations in the Middle East are so virulently against them. The so-called war on terror uh, just looks for terrorists to try and capture them or kill them. It doesn't look at what makes people blow themselves up. Yeah, why do young people behave in this manner? And as Kenyans, are we completely honest with ourselves about why the war has played itself out the way it has? Sources state that Mohamed Fazul may have already left the country through Lunga Lunga to an unknown destination. Who is harboring him? That answer lies not with the Americans or with the Al-Qaeda, but with the Kenyan citizenry. We don't need any outside help. We know better than anyone else. If there is any trouble anywhere or any activity, we are aware more than anyone else. And we have an interest more than anybody else on this matter. So that's a very uh, simple matter to address. We know who is a terrorist and who is not a terrorist. The search for Mohammed Fazul, as Kenyans commemorate 10 years after a day that changed our history, is bigger than the man himself. It's about Kenyans' knowledge that in their heart of hearts, terrorism is wrong. <laughs> and learning lessons from those who have gone full circle. Who, in your opinion? Anybody, anybody who terrifies another, or maybe anybody who threatens another, because there, there's not a, a certain term to that word. It's about shedding subjectivity, both as a country viewing a community and as a community viewing the rest of the country. And in fighting against terrorism, whether local or international, the nation can realize that the greater good lies in working first as a nation, then as an international community, to overcome the threat of our time. John Allen Namo, KTN Prime.